Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome so much to the Ideas Hive Orlando. My name is Lee Perry, and I'm the Chief Operations Officer of Ideas, helping to advance environmental action worldwide. And this is a very special Ideas Hive because this is a topic that I know absolutely nothing about. And I'm so excited to invite our two guest speakers to take a deep dive into building for a healthier future. But before we get into that, I just wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about ideas for us and, you know, kind of what we do and why it's important for those of you who are here visiting with us for the first time. Ideas for us has a mission to develop, fund, and scale solutions to solve the world's most pressing environmental challenges worldwide. We have branches not just here in Orlando, which is our flagship model, but all over the world. We also have one in St. Pete and on our UCF campus here locally in Orlando, but we also have scaled to Nepal, Rwanda, Guinea, Ghana, uh, DRC, and even Romania. So if you're interested in learning more, please check out our website at ideasforus.org. And um, so why do we have these Ideas Hive meetings? Well, number one, this type of information about environmental advocacy and United Nations Sustainable Development Goals should be free. And we believe that talking about these things and bringing people into a room together is the first step to actually getting boots on the ground to combat some of these issues. So that's why the Ideas Hive started back in 2008 uh, as a youth-led grassroots initiative. And then we started mobilizing volunteers and raising money and raising awareness and being able to actually get support, financial support to do projects in these different focus areas and ignite a, a movement here in Central Florida, which has scaled internationally. Some of these projects uh, include solar workforce training programs and our energy focus, urban agriculture, like our fleet farming program, which has basically turned into its own sub program. Uh, we have waste audits and we also do shoreline plantings, tree plantings, beach cleanups, uh, climate strikes, so many different uh, projects in each focus area in energy, water, food, waste, and ecology. And uh, why do we do this work? Well, what would happen if we didn't talk about sustainability or climate change? You know, people say ignorance is bliss, but not if it's detrimental to your future, right? So we believe in talking about these challenges and getting input from the community, intergenerational uh, members of the community from different backgrounds, different demographics, bringing everybody together so that we can find these solutions on our own and not stand by waiting for policy to change. You know, we are consumers, so we drive demand. So our voices should be heard. So let's mobilize and get our community involved. So if you have the capacity to donate, I know times are really hard for people due to COVID-19 and we respect that. But if you have the ability to donate or become a member, we highly recommend that you visit our website and uh, donate to ideasforus.org slash donate. If you don't have uh, the financial capacity, you can always join one of our eco committees. We have committees that meet every month in energy, water, food, waste, ecology, and also for our climate strikes and our media and marketing team. If you have any time to give, please let us know, sign up. Um, we would love to get you involved and even just uh, help us with even grant writing. Now we are hiring right now and we're also accepting applications for other positions that we're not quite ready to hire for yet, but we're starting the vetting process. So if you're interested in, in getting involved with us, please visit our website, ideasforus.org slash jobs. Uh, we have a diverse uh, range of different opportunities to uh, hopefully include you as part of our team. We run like a family and we are definitely mission driven. So if you feel like you would fit in, definitely sign up and visit our website to learn more. If you're looking for school credit, we have paid and unpaid internships available. We have between 30 to 80 interns a semester, and it's a really great part of what we do. It's actually an essential part of what we do because our interns actually help bring new, fresh ideas, 
new input, you know, TikTok, whatever that is. Uh, you know, our interns bring fun ideas to the table and teach us. And together, we're able to continue to grow and expand this movement with fresh ideas. And you really leave a legacy when you become an intern with us. So if you'd like to join, we are accepting applications until August 28th, which is the deadline. And that's going to be our onboarding day. So check out our website, ideasforus.org slash internships. And we'll be so excited to welcome you to the team on August 28th. Uh, if you are a podcast type of person uh, and you learn by listening, definitely check out our, our Ideas for Us podcast. We have so many awesome interviews. This has been, you know, the silver lining to working from home more and having to uh, self-isolate a little bit due to COVID-19. We've been able to interview some really amazing people in the community and, and learn more about some of the initiatives that they're working on. And I'll tell you right off the bat, I've learned so much by conducting some of these interviews. And I'm really excited to share uh, a lot of the, the things that we've been learning. So check this out. And uh, one of the major uh, interviews that we did last month was the uh, interview with Chuck O'Neill who is one of the lead activists in the forefront of Amendment 1 that's coming up on our November ballot, uh, the Right to Clean Water uh, Amendment. And we want you to vote yes on that. However, there's a lot of uh, challenges with this amendment. It's a very big, uh, big, you know, uh, controversial issue that you know uh, interferes with our way of thinking right and it makes some people feel a little uncomfortable to think that you would give uh, a right to a water body to have clean water but this is not just for water bodies it's for ourselves you know there is there's no uh, amendment that basically gives a human being a right to clean water and what that definition is uh, which is why you know flint michigan is still seeing the problems that it's seeing today and that's why we still have issues with really extreme runoff and algae blooms because we don't have any legal bearing to combat some of these large corporations and protect our waterways and preserve our drinking water uh, there's no legal structure in place to give us what we need to be able to defend these water bodies so this amendment is of huge you know, amendment that is one of the first of its kind here in the U.S. and uh, it's going to be coming up on the November ballot. So listen to our podcast and it'll also be on YouTube with Chuck O'Neill, uh, the Right to Clean Water Amendment discussion. Uh, water was our month last month um, and we took a deep dive into some other experts that are leading the change. And so we had an interview with Gabrielle Milch, who is the head of the St. John's Riverkeeper, who talked all about the Central Florida Water Initiative. Now, why water? What is so important about water? Water is boring. It's clear. You just look at it. It's blue. What's going on with our water? It's not boring. It is amazing. It is, it is essential to life. And, um, you know, I'll tell you right off the bat that our water crisis is going to hit us far before sea level rise, right? we are sucking water out of our aquifers faster than we're replenishing it and yet a thousand new people move to florida every single day so what's going to happen in 10 years we're already in a crisis when it comes to corporations moving in and sucking our water dry so we have to figure out what we can do as individuals uh, and how we can influence policy and elect the right candidates that can be in power to protect these water bodies, right? So that's what Gabrielle and I talk about during this podcast, the Clean Water Initiative 2020, and what that actually means. Uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protections right now is hosting these various workshops, and you're able to actually submit public comments. Um, the next uh, workshop will be August 12th at 9 a.m., and you can submit a uh, comment by visiting this OWP uh, rulemaking at floridadep.gov. Um, it says by 20, July 24th, but that was for the last workshop. For this workshop, you can continue to submit a public comment. And um, what does that mean? You know, what is, what is the Clean Water Initiative trying to do? Well, right now, we're trying to just 
fully be able to define what harm means to a water body. Does that mean saltwater intrusion? Does that mean uh, runoff? Does that mean, uh, you know, the uh, overconsumption of water? And if we can clearly define that, then we can clearly use that as a parameter to create policy and be able to influence uh, the permitting process for when developers are coming here and being able to build in areas where they really shouldn't because there's not enough water for those people who are moving in at such an extreme rate. But since there's no uh, way to, you know, combat that in the court system, you know, people are building sky rise condos and, and huge complexes in areas where there's not enough water to support those people. And this is, this is something that we are trying to bring awareness to because people are making a profit in some aspects while in the meantime, other people are definitely going to be in a crisis in the next 10 years. And we want to make sure they're not buying up land and then being in a situation where they're going to be climate change refugees in the next 10 years, right? So check out our, our interview with Gabrielle Milch and also the Central Florida Water Initiative website. Uh, last month, we also had a really cool interview with John Dunn. Uh, the author of this book called Drying Up, The Freshwater Crisis in Florida in collaboration with the Winter Park Health Foundation. Uh, definitely check out that video on our YouTube. He's an incredible journalist and he has so much knowledge about the history of Florida so that you can understand why we're in a situation that we're in where we're in a water crisis and no one's talking about it and why uh, is probably not going to stop if we don't let our voices be heard today. So definitely check that out. Uh, we have an incredible partnership with the local Orlando Zero Hour chapter that's been partnering with us to host these really cool uh, uh, panels in their project reuse and reduce uh, campaign that they're launching. And we did some discussions on renewable energy, reducing plastic and food waste, local food systems, and fast fashion. And all of those videos and panels are on our YouTube right now. We really didn't do any of the work. This was all led by very young, very active in their community leaders that are driving the change and the advocacy from the Orlando Zero Hour chapter. So definitely check them out. Um, another YouTube video that we launched was our Seeding Mercy uh, uh, donation that we gave to this organization. So Seeding Mercy is this really amazing um, African teaching farm that helps to incubate urban agriculture in areas of extreme poverty. And when I say extreme poverty, I'm saying that these places are so remote that people are literally just, just starving in, in the streets. And so what they're doing is they're collecting donations. And we were one of the first uh, $1,000 donations from our Solutions Fund uh, micro grant that we did back in 2017, 2018. And since then, they've been able to teach hundreds of people in South Africa how to grow food uh, on the, some of their training farms. And then they've actually been able to help them distribute their grain, they give back a percentage of their grain and actually give seeds to other new farmers so that they can continue to, uh, you know, perpetuate these growing systems and, you know, turn land that otherwise would be completely dead uh, to bountiful uh, farms in their communities and help combat these hunger issues. So I'm so, so grateful to have had the opportunity to interview their, their CEO. And so please check out their website, seedingmercy.org and our YouTube interview with their incredible leader. So um, I did this a little backwards. Usually I talk about last month's hive first, but I, I feel like it ties very closely into this month's hive because the same time that I locked in our speaker, uh, Ian Dormal from Ecospheres, I was meeting uh, Lindsay Perez at a panel who helped introduce me to Shona. And, and so uh, 
you know, first things first, last month was water month. And we also talked a lot about waste as well. And, you know, Ecospheres is doing a really great job at using NASA technology to remove PCBs, which are polychlorinated biphenols, biphenols, cannot say that very well. And they're carcinogenic uh, industrial chemicals that exist virtually in every major waterway contaminating our aquatic systems. So where are they from? Well, they're used in manufactured goods and paints and electrical equipment. And when I was locking in the speaker and I was learning about their really cool systems of fil filtering these different trace metals and chemicals out of the soil and out of these major water bodies, I thought, well, if they're in our water, are they in our buildings that we're living in and breathing in and teaching our children in and playing in and going to the movie theaters in? And so that's what inspired me to start seeking out our speakers um, who we're going to introduce in just a second. But, you know, before we introduce them, you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are kind of our platform to grading our impact in the eco action projects that we do. And I wanted to learn how to tie together the United Nations SDGs to this topic. And I've learned so much because from that uh, Ecospheres discussion and this discussion that we're gonna talk about tonight, especially upon a world where COVID-19 exists, how do we pull ourselves out of an economic crisis, right? And when you're talking about SDG 9, uh, building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusivity and sustainability in, in fostering innovation in our buildings. And you talk about SDG 3, where you're talking about good health and well-being. We have to innovate our way out of this economic crisis, right? We can bring in new ideas and, and have a whole new uh, concept of our world and let ourselves invest in that concept, excuse me, to create jobs and to be better than how we've been, right? And there's so much need out there. And uh, to tie the two together, you know, Ian was saying that he wasn't an environmentalist originally when he and his, his partners came together and created Ecospheres but they saw so many problems with the environment and water quality and how you take these PCBs out of the water and how they're not properly managed. They're driven like across the country and put into these vats underground where they just sit and leach out chemicals over the years. They're not properly, you know, and chemically uh, decomposed so that they can be safer and, and disposed of in a safer way, just like, our nuclear waste and our coal waste, it's, it's not being properly treated, uh, the byproducts at least. So we're still susceptible to uh, super fund and soil contamination that if we have major flooding could really just harm our waterways and, and really hurt us. So he was not an environmentalist when he learned about all of these things, but he said, you know, when I'm an entrepreneur, so when I look at a problem, I see an opportunity. And that's what I see with our next speakers as well. When you're thinking about these chemicals that are probably around us all day that we don't even talk about, that could be harming us in, in cognitive ways, that could be harming us, you know, just in, in physical health ways, we need to have a deeper conversation about how to innovate our way out of this as well. And so that is my segue to introducing uh, our two speakers, uh, Lindsay and Shona, who I'm going to invite to uh, take over the slides. And yes, thank you so much for joining us. Please introduce yourselves. Thank you for having us. Um, uh, this has been a long time in the making, Lee, as you mentioned. Um, I met Lee a couple months back, probably pre-COVID at a conference, and we just had a great chat on um, High performance design in the built industry and how we at DLR Group, um, especially led by Shona and our high performance design team, 
and supplemented by all of our employee owners and designers, we merge art and science to design better buildings. So next. So Shona's gonna explain a lot more about um, DLR group and our specific role and our employee owners and one of her research projects, but I wanted to take a step back and explain how with climate change, what is the role of the architect, engineer, and all building professionals in when it comes to climate change? We actually have a significant role. In the next slide, um, in 2007, Ed Mazaria, an architect, uh, did a global teach-in on uh, climate change and sea level, or and did a call of action, if you will, to the building industry and to uh, the education industry to educate up and coming students on our role in climate change. And so he did a call of action called the Architecture 2030 Challenge. And this slide is um, a slide from the AIA, it's the American Institute of Architects, and they, they tacked on the reporting mechanism to the challenge. So the challenge is to design buildings uh, and retrofit buildings to be carbon neutral by the year 2030. We've got less than nine and a half years left to do that. So um, in the next slide, that original challenge was to address operational carbon. So how are we reducing the energy and, op and operational carbon of our buildings? We're one of the biggest uh, emitters in the world, the built in the built in building industry. So since the challenge has started, we've been reducing our operational carbon pretty well that actually embodied carbon has taken over and bit the bigger piece of the pie of what we need to address now as an industry, which focuses on the life cycle of materials across the board. So we now have a new challenge by 2040 to also be embodied carbon neutral with our buildings. So that pays really close attention to structural materials that we're electing in our buildings building envelopes, so everything that encloses a building to keep it weather tight, and then the interior finishes of buildings. But we can't think about carbon alone. So if we go to the next slide, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, has designed a framework. It used to be formerly our COPE top 10, so our Committee on the Environment, top 10 measures in which to measure good design. And so these are 10 measures in which a design team would look at to make sure that we're being very holistic. We talked about water last month for the Hive was water month. We have a process in our industry in which we look at water as well. We look at ecosystems, we look at equity and resiliency and adaptation. And materials that we select, if we go to the next slide, of these measures, seven of these measures relate to materials themselves. You could probably stretch, but direct specification a material I select as an architect and what I'm putting into buildings has a direct impact on these measures. Go to the next slide. So we can't think just about carbon emissions when it comes to um, materials. We also want to talk about human health. So there's two camps when we talk about materials and we're going to do a simple exercise coming up on explaining why it's important to not only think about carbon emissions when it comes to material section. So what are the environmental product declarations or for human health, what are the human or the health product declarations? So this is, consider it like a nutrition sheet for every single material where we're understanding what is going into a material and we can make uh, an informed decision on whether maybe there's chemicals of concern or there's a high carbon of that material because it doesn't have a good end of life cycle. So to explain this further, let's go to the next slide. So here's an exercise, something simple. We all know um, Coca-Cola. So in this slide, we're looking at two different examples related to health and, and body carbon. One is the packaging and one is the actual uh, chemical consideration. But at the end of the day, they're both, they're all three Coke products and we're gonna all view them as Coke products and maybe not understand the health benefits of Coke A to B to C, or the environmental impact of A, B, and C. So next slide. So starting with formulas, we all know that process or natural synthetic or hybridized sugar has a different impact on human health. And so 
we would look at what is the ingredients, the label of the Coke product itself, and see how it would have an impact on um, calories consumed, sugars consumed, things like that. And then if we were really informed consumers, we would look more into what are the differences between all the different artificial sugars versus natural sugars. So that's one way of measuring a formula of a everyday product. Next slide is taking a look at measuring the packaging of each of these um, examples. And the physical packaging, whether it's aluminum, glass, or plastic, what is the carbon footprint of delivering that recipe into each, each of these packages? So if we go to the next slide, we're going to we replace Coca-Cola products and look at it through the lens of um, building products or go to the next slide, we can take a, a look at um, a carpet manufacturer, Michael Davis, quote, if I can gargle with it, is it worth the amount of energy take to produce it? So if a re healthy recipe is great, but it's delivered in a, in a product that is unenvironmental, is it worth producing? The same thing goes in the next slide for how we look at building products. Um, we specify so many building products. I explained we specify as a building industry, we specify the structure of it steel, concrete, mass timber. We specify building envelopes, so that's doors, walls, roof, insulation, all the things that you can't see under the finished base of the building product. And then we specify products for the interior, um, carpets, ceilings, doors, things like that. So if you go to the next slide, the next slide is a sample of a material board for interior finishes. Now in our building industry, there's very, there's so many different product declarations or certifications that help designers select products that are more environmentally friendly, have a better end of life cycle when it's at the end of its intended use. Um, there's even product declarations and certifications that allow us to know whether it has a better impact on social justice from where it's the product material is extracted, manufactured, how it's transported, how it's impacting um, equity within the whole life cycle of the product, and then what does its end of life cycle look like? So this is the type of uh, information we as building professionals are constantly looking for. And this is a, a relatively new um, approach to selecting materials. Previously, early in my career even, we would select materials based on aesthetics and durability. Maybe even how does that perform as a building envelope to help reduce energy efficiency. But we're looking at every product and making sure there's, at the end of this, I'll give you a list of resources that you can go to to understand chemicals and stuff a little further, but we're looking at all these types of declarations to make sure for specifying products that do less harm. So, and how we do that, the next slide, is for the health aspect, we look at it through, we vet it through an HPD or a health product declaration. And the next slide, a health product declaration is really the first step in this material transparency approach. So this is where a product manufacturer is self-declaring the chemicals or the products in their particular building product that they are putting on um, a standardized declaration. From here, they would attempt to get a certification to prove that not only have they declared their chemicals within their product, but they have also gone further into a certification that their product does not contain any chemicals of concern or it's not um, a red list. Um, Chemical. So a red list means that these are the top chemicals of concern and we don't want to use them in products because they have a profound impact on human health. So this is step one in our industry of getting this level of transparency. And that's for the, uh, the health camp. So for the embodied carbon or the environmental impact camp, we look at an EPD. And we bet it over its life cycle and its location of where the project is compared to where it's if the product is extracted, manufactured, et cetera. 
So on the next slide is an example of an environmental product declaration. And we use this also, we um, take the information from a product declaration and we put it into our program that we use to design buildings. So it, and we're able to run an analysis on which products that we have currently in our building model and that we're debating specifying. And we can see which products have a greater impact to see if we can find an alternative. So some examples of products that I have seen that have a big impact on uh, embodied carbon is our, the insulations that we are specifying for buildings, gypsum board that has a pretty large impact, but also our structural materials. So going from steel to mass timber would have a great um, impact on lowering embodied carbon for a particular building product. So, the next slide, um, I just barely touched the surface of these, but I just wanted to share two links. These are certification programs, and I actually completed the Parsons Healthy Materials Lab certification um, last year, and it, it is a great um, way of understanding chemists, uh, building um, construction, manufacturers approach to chemicals and understanding where how this whole gamut of trying to understand what makes up materials that we put in not only commercial buildings, education buildings, our homes, and what is the touch surface impact. Um, when COVID came um, to fruition, um, some of our material transparency experts in our firm were tapped on because microbials is actually a chemical of concern for materials but people wanted to go back to using them for buildings because of addressing COVID. There's other ways of addressing it um, with materials, but this course and these series of courses are a good way of digging deep. And it's, it is not just taught by one person, it's taught by a series of invited experts of about 35 experts. So um, I would highly recommend it. And it's actually starting another semester in the next few weeks and it's been dropped down to $100 for anyone interested. And the next slide is another series of resources. These are more resources to databases in which we use for vetting materials. Um, some are free, some require a subscription. Um, and what I've noticed with all these different databases is now we need to get a database that connects health and um, embodied carbon together because currently that doesn't exist. So one database might be uh, investigating health and transparency related to chem chemicals that would impact health versus another database is addressing transparency for embodied carbon materials. But we have to make the right decision for both um, as designers. And that currently is a little bit more complicated. We have to do a lot of um, extra legwork to connect the two dots at the moment. So, so I rushed through a little bit of materials because I really want my colleague that I, um, Shona um, Odi is a high performance design leader for DLR group. And she has been leading our um, high performance design team for a number of years. And she has been working on some great research related to indoor quality. So Shona, if you want to introduce yourself and share. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks for, thanks for having both of us. Um, so as Lindsay mentioned, I'm our high performance design leader at DLR Group and really focus on a holistic building performance. From talking to Lee at the start of this session, um, one thing that came up was, you know, the, the, the focus on some of this content around um, younger people. So I wanted to just take a second to talk about why I focus on air quality personally, uh, because it wasn't what I set out to do. As a lot of sustainability professionals, it wasn't what I initially targeted as my focus of my job, and I'm really glad that I got there. Um, and so um, my background was in mechanical engineering and understanding HVAC. And uh, I grew up in Ireland, so I, I studied there where there was a big focus on holistic building performance and then did a, a dual master's in sustainability, which got me over to the States and I went to Purdue. And so um, when I started at DLR Group, which is, you know, it's a holistic practice. We have architects and engineers under one roof and uh, we're also an employee owned firm. Uh, and so one thing that I've noticed from just what seven years there is um, being a troublemaker is a good thing. 
And this whole story actually comes out of kind of being that way. Uh, so for the younger people listening to this or students or people starting out, um, I would say that uh, be opinionated because I think it can lead you to, to jobs that you love. It's definitely led me there. Um, and so really the, the, our whole focus on indoor environmental quality is because um, clients kept asking us to grade their buildings and give a grade for performance. And um, what they were really looking for was an energy grade. And um, it was, I think it was my first or second day at work. And I really disagreed with using the term performance to just, um, to just look at energy because a high performing building is so much more than that. And um, a colleague of ours pointed out, he said, you disagree with me and I wanna know why. And I kind of pitched this idea to look holistically, not only at energy and water, but also look at how buildings impact people. So looking at um, thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustical comfort, and air quality. And um, fortunately, we work for a firm where that was allowed. We were allowed to disagree and it's kind of led to this. So that's what I want to talk about today. So I ended up designing this process to quantify the indoor environment. And at the very start, it was always focused on being simple enough that an eighth grader could do it. And um, so typically I actually work with students to do this process. And so um, photos that you're seeing here are actually just my colleagues doing a school walkthrough of, um, you know, we normally partner with science club or um, eco clubs and we teach them how to use our tools, how to read uh, floor plans and take measurements. And then typically they actually will continue to do those measurements. I'll leave the building for a couple of months and then we'll come back and dissect the data together, which is just awesome. Um, and so why we're going to focus on air and um, you know, I've been focused on air quality specifically for, for a number of years, um, and it's obviously a lot more important right now, but um, really the reason that we focus on air is because, uh, you know, you can survive weeks without food, you can survive days without out water, but only um, a few minutes without air. And so when you think about consumption, right, we all know the rules of thumb around how many gallons of water that you want to consume a day, but we actually don't know how many gallons of air we consume a day, and it's much more than that. So we want to make sure that the the content of air that we're breathing is healthy, and it makes sure that um, make sure that that the air we're breathing is is going to support not only our physical health but also our mental. And so, um, you know, over the past couple of years, research has really started to focus on indoor air quality, especially as it relates to cognitive function. And so uh, there's this there's a series that has come out of Harvard School of Public Health called uh, the COGFX study. And uh, it was really trying to share studies that had really focused before now on casinos and, and places where um, they were trying to over ventilate the, the spaces in order for people to stay awake. Uh, but intuitively, if we're staying awake, we're staying more alert and our brain is working better. So um, a couple of years ago, Harvard School of Public Health started this series of research projects that have, have then been um, shared with the general public. And so I wanted to talk through three of the three different scales of that study. And it starts with study one that really focused on a lab environment. And just to mention here, the reason they were doing this is because we're not only going to buildings to go to a casino or gamble or go to for you know one period of time to go to a store. We spend even before COVID-19, 90% of our time indoors. So there was this big question of, you know, people kept on wanting to get away or get outdoors and we started to forget how to optimize what was where we spend most of our time and that's indoors um, and so in study one um, in this lab environment um, Harvard School of Public Health took uh, 24 uh, research participants they put them in a lab environment and they simulated three different scenarios the first one being just a code compliant building and honestly, from the amount of air quality testing that I've done, a code compliant building is 
Um, it's not it's not that way a lot of the time. A lot of buildings we're seeing are underventilated. But um, in in the in this specific study, there was three scenarios. As I mentioned, the first one was a code compliant building, and then there was a green scenario, so a building that had uh, selected all the healthy materials that Lindsay had mentioned, and then there was an enhanced green scenario that not only selected healthy materials, but also ventilated uh, double the amount. So they brought in twice as much fresh air as uh, would be typical in a code compliant building. And so based on the different scenarios that they simulated, they got those 24 occupants to do a series of cognitive function tests and found that there was a profound impact on cognitive function when the healthy materials were in the space and then also when the space was ventilated more. And so when we think about cognitive function, um, the, this specific study series broke it into a number of types of cognitive function. And they found that the, the most um, creative and strategic thinking was the most impacted by the air quality. So strategic thinking was impacted by nearly 300% when the, the air quality conditions changed. And this really has led to a slew of a different a, additional research projects because to us, this is the business case for healthy buildings. This isn't just an altruistic thing anymore. There's a bottom line to cognitive function because that's why we sit in offices is to is to be productive people. So it's led to scaling up of this research project to not only a lab environment, but also to um, a number of buildings. So that's study number two. It took a series of green buildings where there was an assumption that they would have a better, better indoor environment. And again, saw that there was an impact on uh, cognitive function when the indoor air quality was modified. And so now there, this active study um, that's going on right now is study number three, and it's a global building study. So we went from 24 people in a lab to a number of green buildings, and now we have uh, 100 buildings that are participating in what at Harvard School of Public Health is calling uh, the global building study. And so in this study, this is 100 buildings with 1,000 participants, so 10 people per building all across the globe. And uh, DLR groups actually participating in this study. So 10 of the buildings in this study are our spaces. And there's another two locations of our clients that are participating in the study. And so each occupant or participant in the study receives a, a Fitbit to track their sleep patterns in addition to their movements. And then it's paired to an indoor air quality monitor that is tracking temperature, relative humidity, and then also carbon dioxide, total volatile organic compounds, which is really linked to the healthy materials piece that Lindsay talked about. And then PM 2.5, which is a small particulate matter that is generated by combustion. So things like uh, car exhausts and most, most uh, people in California will now be familiar with that term due to the forest fires. And so while we wait for that study to come through, we're definitely seeing a big focus on other studies around um, cognitive function and um, CO2 specifically and just in relation to the ventilation level. So this is just another visualization of um, how the carbon dioxide level can impact cognitive function. So if you see on the, the right hand side here, you can see that um, so 600 parts per million is the circle that has the white in the middle of it. And so that's kind of very similar to what the carbon dioxide level is outside, which is around 400 parts per million. So that's that green scenario that we're talking about. And then um, 1,000 parts per million, that's your code compliant scenario. And then 2,500 parts per million um, is, is actually what we see typically in a lot of schools from 2,500 to 5,000 parts per million. Um, offices are a lot better, especially due to open plans. Um, but this is, we do see these values all the time. Um, and on the bottom of this axis here, you can kind of see how um, each type of cognitive function can be impacted by these different levels of CO2 concentration. So um, 
you know, we, we talk about this a lot with, with different types of occupants, whether it be someone in their home or someone in an office environment or someone, some, someone in a school. And so um, one thing that comes up a lot is, should we evacuate the building if the carbon dioxide level exceeds 1000? And so the answer there is no. And that's why I have this graph on the left here. Um, so this is just a hazard scale to kind of explain what carbon dioxide is doing to your, to your body. And so um, if you look at this 1000 parts per million, this is a comfort boundary, right? This isn't a health boundary, this is a comfort boundary. And it's all the way up at 200,000 parts per million certain deaths. So when we talk about a hazard here, this hazard isn't something that's going to cause you um, any health impacts. It's more about uh, making sure that you're creating a space where people can thrive. And so um, where we want to stay is under this 1,000 parts per million for uh, brain activity and cognitive function. Uh, but then really, when, it, when we think about um, the, the area that we really want to avoid is this 2,500 parts per million, because this, is, this cognitive function, function level then changes to cognitive dysfunction. And this is really when we start going into sleep mode. Um, I see one question here. What are your thoughts on the breeding building in Pittsburgh built by Gensler? Do you have other architectural reference that does a good job creating uh, better ventilation? Uh, Amazon building, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to look up the breathing building uh, by Gensler. Is it a, if it's a naturally ventilated building? Um, I can definitely talk through that. Um, so, yeah, Sarah, if you could uh, clarify, are you are you thinking of um, a naturally ventilated building? We can definitely talk about that um, if you want to clarify your question there. Um, so just while we're waiting for that to be clarified, I did want to talk about some other variables. And so, um, you know, the last graph talked about carbon dioxide levels. Um, one second, I'm just getting a knock on the door here. Well, Sean, <clears throat> well, Shona steps away. I'll share a brief story. So. We had those um, air quality monitors within our offices uh, across the group. And one day in our office building here in Orlando, we had, um, so now I'm sharing a quick story while you stepped away. Um, one oh, day in Orlando, we had uh, construction going on both the six and the floors above and floors below. And our we could smell the air and we were all experiencing cognitive function issues. and. Shona explained that because we were experiencing levels at a certain rate that were comfortable and it increased by 25%, it had a really profound impact on all of us in our breathing. And so we did actually evacuate the building for 24 hours to get rid of that. But um, without those monitors, we actually used the monitors within our building to have great conversations with our building manager on temperature, humidity, VOCs, and just activities going on in the building. And I know you have another example from one of our offices. So. Thanks for stepping in there, Lindsay. I had a, a knock on the door there. Um, this is the, the beauty of working from home, right? When work collides with home life. So thanks for stepping in there. Um, this, this graph is another um, focusing on another variable, and it has to do with, with, with TVOCs. And so um, carbon dioxide is something that humans emit. And so really it's, the reason it's a good proxy for ventilation is because ventilation is there to dilute bioeffluents generated by human beings. So when it comes to carbon dioxide, the toxins are humans. Um, but there's other toxins that humans bring into their buildings. And so um, the most common one is, is total volatile organic compounds. And so uh, this they're generated or off gas by any material you bring into a space. So um, I noticed recently I ordered a new rug and I can smell the toxins coming from the rug. Um, I should have consulted Lindsay on my purchase first, but this specific product is off gassing a lot of toxins. And so similarly with paints or aerosols, cleaners, 
uh, thinking now of disinfectants due to COVID-19. These are carcinogenic compounds that can off-gas at different levels. And so one thing that has been really incentivized by things like LEED certification is to flush out the building before, uh, after construction, but before occupancy. And I put this slide in here because uh, sometimes they don't work and it has to do with the concentration level in the space. So, um, you know, if you have one specific um, piece of furniture that has volatile organic compounds in it and it's off-gassing, that may, it might be okay to just purge the building one time. Um, but if you have a lot of them in there, they can off-gas uh, continuously. And so, in this specific graph, we're actually looking at a hotel that we went in and we, we did post-occupancy. And so, um, you know, at 6 p.m., you can see that the HVAC system is turning off and the, the TVOCs are off-gassing. So uh, they're increasing, but they're increasing at the very time that people are sleeping in the space. And so you can see day in, day out, the, the TVOCs go up when the HVAC goes off and then they go down again when the HVAC comes on. But they climb, and they climb to a level that's unsafe. And so we can't see these things. And a lot of the time, we can't even smell them. Um, human beings are very sensitive sensors, but we're not very good at dashboarding. We may think we, know, we may know we have a headache, but we don't know why. And so this is where monitors come in, using sensor technology to quantify these things so that we can inform solutions. And so um, lastly, I just wanted to talk about one other variable, and that's PM 2.5. And so um, PM 2.5 is something that's generated outside. So um, it's typically generated by combustion um, and can be um, created by things like, um, as I mentioned, car exhaust, um, but also uh, things like forest fires. So here you'll see uh, just a map of America where you can see that uh, the, the PM 2.5 is a little bit higher in places like Mon Montana, and that's actually because there was um, forest fires there when I pulled this graph. Um, but then this, this has become a big thing in, in California now just because of the forest fires there. Uh, so there's really a combination of diluting the toxins generated by human beings and then reducing the amount of uh, toxins we bring into a space due to materials. And then when it comes to PM 2.5, just keeping, keeping that outside as much as possible due to filtration. And so, you know, we've been operating in the air quality field for around a decade. Um, but when we started to see um, how much um, the air quality was compromised in school environments. It's really where we started out doing this. Um, in, instead, we started to look internally and look at our spaces. So, you know, DLR Group's an employee on firm, and we have we have nearly 1,500 occupants in our in our offices, 30 locations. We started to get really worried when we were looking at the research, seeing that a lot of buildings were operating in this cognitive dysfunction mode, and we wanted to see what was happening in our in our own spaces. So. Um, we ended up, me and my colleague, Michael van der Poog, um, which, yeah, so we, we applied for a research grant internally and have actually now received a number of research grants. So this is kind of the fun we get to have outside of work. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about things that we learned from this project. So here's just some summary stats on um, the kind of key focus areas of the project. So we ended up focusing on 21 living labs. So converting all of our offices into these living labs. Um, there's over a thousand employee owners that would have been impacted by that. That results to around uh, 300,000 square feet and 50 real-time sensors. And so we followed the RECEPT standard for indoor air quality sensing. And so for those of you interested in air quality uh, or doing these types of deployments, Reset has an awesome website with a free standard. You don't need to buy any books from them. You can get it all for free. And they also have a series of videos that you can learn all about indoor air quality. Uh, there's such an awesome research and a great place to start. So that's really where I built my foundational knowledge of how to do large scale deployments like this, uh, because before this, it was all around um, schools and temporary installations. 
And so here's kind of a summary of our the, the study itself. Uh, the first phase was set up. So we wanted to deploy, we, well, we did deploy monitors across all of our um, all of our offices. Um, and th that goal of that was really to convert them into learning labs. Um, we also did a before survey. So we uh, asked our employees for feedback. And then in phase two, we um, started to monitor to see if there was any problems. Uh, so we were really troubleshooting to see if there was any issues in any of our spaces. And we found some and then went through analyzing that and getting an understanding of how we could make the buildings better. Uh, and then the outcome, which continues, is we wanted to receive reset certification of all of our offices. And so we've done a number of research reset projects now, and it's really, it's really a, a, a third party verification of our air quality to get reset certification. It's a little different to say lead or well certification where you have to spend a lot of time documenting things. Um, reset doesn't care how you get there. They just set a threshold for performance and you install indoor air quality monitors in order to verify your performance. So that, that is an ongoing outcome of this project. Um, we also inherently just, we, we continue to learn about our buildings and we share this data with as I mentioned, we share it with Harvard, but we've also shared it with a number of um, academic in institutions that are, have PhD or master's students who want to write white, write white papers or do an analysis on indoor air quality. So if anyone on the call <clears throat> has any hypotheses that they need a large indoor air quality data set, we'd be happy to share that with you or partner with you on a research project. And then, yeah, the goal is really to co-publish with you and, and continue to create a feedback loop on how we're operating buildings and designing them and if we can make them better. Um, so a couple of things that we learned from the project that I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, so first of all, equipment. Um, I learned a lot about indoor air quality equipment and now realize that not all indoor air quality equipment is made equal. Um, now we kind of split the criteria into three different types. On the left is um, a scientific grade monitor that costs around $20,000. Um, in the center, these cost around $1,200 to $2,000. And these are more commercial grade monitors. And on the right here is a, like a consumer grade monitor, which can cost around $20. And so all of these sense the variables that I mentioned. So CO2, temperature, relative humidity, PM 2.5 and TVOCs, um, but they're all range and accuracy levels. And so a scientific grade monitor, none of us really need that unless we're in a lab. Um, and on the right hand side, these consumer grade monitors, um, right out of the box, they're not sensing the right things. Um, so I would definitely not recommend them. So I'd really aim to be in this commercial grade, which is in the center here. Um, and so I have this in my home now. This is becoming um, really important because our homes don't have HVAC a lot of the time. We don't have mechanical ventilation and we're expected to cook and sleep in the same place that we're working. And so, for instance, like if I burn breakfast, I don't leave and go to a mechanically ventilated space. I inhale that PM 2.5 all day. And so having these monitors can really help us troubleshoot in passive ways, right? Do we have to open a window? Or does, um, another thing I learned was like, I really like incense and that's creating PM 2.5 or I like um, have different like essential oils. And again, that's TVOCs coming into the space. And sometimes I decide what level I wanna put in my space, but without having the monitors, I can't decide that. And you're compromising your air quality uh, unknowingly. Um, so this, this, this slide is really, um, I, I'm very passionate about high quality data. And so one thing that comes up a lot is, um, well, you know, can I just get the really cheap monitors and put a lot of them in the space and then together they'll become really high quality data. And um, this is kind of a joke of ours, I guess, that, you know, if you got 
100 chicken brains and you put them together, uh, would that give you an Einstein? No. So it's kind of the same when it comes to um, air quality monitors, you really want to make sure that you have high quality data. And thanks, Lindsay and Lee, for the little smile. Thanks for laughing at my jokes online. It didn't help. Um, so for the specific deployment and the case study we want to talk about, um, we used a Tongdi monitor. Um, I really like these. They've been around probably the longest. Um, and so the way that you figure out like where to put your air quality monitors has to do with um, kind of a range of 5,000 square foot. So if you wanted to deploy these in any of your buildings, you typically say one monitor per 5,000 square foot. And that's assuming that, you know, you're in an open plan office or an open plan room. If there are walls around the room, like if it's a conference room or if you are in a classroom, you want one per room. And so this is kind of how we visualize where they are. Uh, and so here's kind of a snapshot of what we ended up with. Uh, we used a dashboard called CLEAR, so Q-L-E-A-R. And you kind of get this live bird's eye view then of all of your air quality. So this, this is actually just a snapshot from our intranet. So any staff member can go in and say like, okay, I'm in Denver, my office is unhealthy. What does that mean? Or um, why is my the office in New York sensitive? So um, and actually, just from going through this data, I know that the reason the Denver office is saying unhealthy is because they didn't have any sustainable material goals. And so they just selected any material that they could get their hands on at the time based on aesthetics and it's causing high uh, TVOCs. And New York has a very different challenge. So, you know, that building has a ventilation system that's not providing adequate outdoor air. So here you see that the, the CO2 level there is at like over 2000. So, you know, then there's a bottom line for changing which building we, we go to, right? Or should we really be renting in a building that uh, puts our staff into sleep mode? You know, so we, we probably want to avoid that. And so we're actually using this data now as part of informing our return to work policy. So um, with COVID-19, there isn't a COVID-19 sensor but there's ways that we can use this data as a proxy for healthy buildings. And so one of the main recommendations for, for returning to work with COVID is, uh, or returning to work in a COVID environment, because not, not returning to work with COVID, um, is that you want to double the amount of ventilation that you're bringing into your space. But that can have a huge energy impact on our building. So what we're doing is looking at our buildings and deciding, okay, well, in our buildings that the carbon dioxide level is already indicating that the ventilation level was double what we needed, we don't need anymore. But then in our New York office, for instance, we, which we've since moved because of this issue, um, maybe we want to request to the building that we want more outdoor air in the space. So because, of, because we have this historical data, we can use this to get an understanding of how we want to move forward. And so we've seen this a lot. Um, it, this started out as a research project to just verify that our buildings were being ventilated effectively, that we were filtering effectively to keep any toxins outside, and that the materials that were being, being brought into the space were not compromising our space. But since then, we have had you know the fire, forest fires in California where we we were waiting for the, the building operator to make decisions really fast. And when we saw our air quality change, we were able to fix it first because we could see the data and be proactive. Um, and it's similar when it comes to now, we can see all the people leaving because we see our CO2 levels go down, but we're also seeing our TVOCs go up because the buildings are cleaning. And so when we return to work, we will make sure that we mod modify to make sure that there isn't any TVOCs remaining in the morning time after cleaning, and also make sure that we're ventilating effectively uh, when our occupants return. So I did just wanna give you a quick uh, sneak peek of what the data kind of looks like. Um, this is just an example of what happened when the forest fires happened in California. Um, so the green zone is the healthy zone. Uh, we're, we're looking at PM 2.5 here. Um, in the blue, you see um, 
outdoor PM 2.5 levels and the red is indoor. And so when, when this happened initially, the PM 2.5 inside was very similar to outside um, because we were ventilating and not filtering effectively. And from seeing this data, we were able to modify or request modifications to our ventilation system so that we were able to get our um, indoor air quality at a healthy level as soon as possible. Um, we're seeing even in, in China where air quality is much more of an issue outside that people are using this as a way to attract talent and actually buildings are being forced to run longer because occupants want to stay there as a, because the buildings themselves are a safe haven. They want to stay in a healthy space. Um, this is just an, another data visualization also in San Francisco um, where we saw that the cleaning crew was not following a green cleaning policy. And so that's, it's typical when you see the data, but see the air quality um, readings for TVOCs peak and then flat line in that way, that um, it can be cleaning products where, you know, they, the, they're sprayed, they stay airborne for a period of time, and then they go down rapidly. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing here. And, you know, in a lot of our offices, we do see just, uh, um, occupant driven CO2 that is higher than normal. And so here you can see, um, you can see three weeks of occupancy here. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the busy days and Thursday, Friday are the days in that first week that are in the green zone because there's less people at work. Uh, and so this kind of information is really helpful now, as I mentioned, uh, and can also get an understanding of, you know, how people are actually behaving in space. And so this is where we want to be. We want to be in this, this functional zone of really being um, within this 600 parts per million zone. Um, this is something that does require more ventilation and more energy to heat and cool. Uh, but we're really seeing that this can help people thrive in space. And, and that's really the kind of spaces that we want to provide. And so um, I did want to mention, you know, a lot of people don't have control over their ventilation, whether it's, you know, because you don't can't afford a new mechanical system in an office or just because um, you don't have it in your home and you're not going to add in an entire mechanical ventilation system. So if that's the case, uh, you can use plants to filter your air. And so there's actually a number of studies emerging that are older studies conducted by NASA uh, because they wanted to filter air in um, in spaceships. So they had evaluated what plants filter air the best. And so certain plants eat certain types of toxins and take them out of your environment. And so um, on the right here is just a snapshot from that study. But um, you probably can't read all of the names here, but I would encourage all of you to just Google Na NASA air filtering plant study, and it can give you um, all of them. I definitely um, have filled my house with these plants. Um, and we actually have more plants than humans in the Chicago office where I'm based because of this study. So um, definitely a helpful way to select which plants can ventilate your air best. And there is a rule of eight plants per person. So for every eight plants of this type, you can filter your air at the same level as a mechanical ventilation system. So a good excuse for the plant lovers out there. Um, so I think we're probably, you know, somewhat out of time here. I did want to mention this is what Reset looks like. I mentioned the, the website already. Uh, to get certified, there's very little documentation. It's all based on health research. Um, it's a fraction of the price of some of the other certifications out there and really focused on real-time data and transparency with occupants. Uh, so please reach out to me if you have any interest in this. I'm just a big fan of this certification and I've done a lot of these projects. So I'd be happy to help anyone try and do their first one. Um, and it, you know, there's so many certifications out there for sustainable buildings um, and thankfully they're aligning. So LEED and uh, the performance score has aligned their air quality standards with Reset. Um, and I guess just this is there's two slides left. And so the, I just wanted to mention the, the project we worked on internally where we gave everyone air quality monitors. Um, 
people really value this information, whether it's just from a transparency standpoint or even to make things relatable. And so um, things are kind of scary right now. And a lot of it has to do with like, we can't see what it is we're inhaling and that can make us sick. And um, these are images, these are photos that people sent me after we deployed monitors in our offices. Um, and so they, it's almost like these were their new pets, right? They were super excited to get this equipment. And so um, I'm really seeing that people value this information. And, um, you know, once we started deploying these internally, people started talking about it. And not just air fanatics like me or HVAC nerds. Like we're talking everybody from um, architects to uh, all our disciplines because they could see an incident and then relay it back to the data that they were seeing. And I think more and more now, there is a burden of proof. We, we're we asking for verification that the buildings we're walking into are clean, that they're healthy, and that we're able to operate without fear. And so I really do believe that um, air quality measurements are the way forward. Um, and you know, it's a way for us to start returning back to buildings in a way that uh, can be somewhat a little bit less daunting when we can actually walk into a building and get that live label of what the air quality is on the full floor. And so, I would encourage you to consider, you know, if you're if you are renting, you know, look at your information. This. I believe that this type of data can help us select buildings to, to rent, buildings to lease, and um, we can select other buildings to, to rent and lease and live in um, based on this information. I really think that it, it will be more of a, um, a way to have competitive, had competitive advantage in the future. Um, and again, it's not about documentation. We just want to verify before we enter these buildings that they're healthy. Um, so I think that's really um, the end here. Um, I guess this image is just summarizing all of the aspects of high-performing buildings um, that that you you would like to or you should consider. Um, we just talked about one of them here because it's it's something that Lindsay and I really care about is indoor air quality. Um, I've seen a couple of chats coming in here, so I guess I'll just wrap up by saying thank you for your time. And thanks for having us. Uh, Lindsay and I have been wanting to compare, combine our, our concepts of materials and air quality for a while. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to do so, Eve. Of course, thank you both so much. And uh, I'm excited to go into the Q&A. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, so thank you. And I learned so much. One of the questions that we have from our friend Stacy, who asked this question right before you started talking about the different uh, options and expenses of the different monitoring systems, but like, what are some inexpensive ways that you can measure CO2 and, and is it worth it when it comes to the actual costs? We didn't really get into like cost, so. Yeah, great question. Um, so. The monitors that we focus on are multivariable monitors. So they always have temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, PM 2.5, and TVOCs. And so that they're in that kind of $600 to $2,500 range. Um, things that I always recommend, so like I have all my family buying indoor air quality monitors uh, because I, re I think it's really important, but you know, asking to buy something that's $600 for your home is is a pretty big ticket item. Um, you can get a carbon dioxide monitor pretty cheap, and there's not that much of a fear that that monitor is going to be an inaccurate. Um, where the cost really is, is in the TVOCs and the PM 2.5, um, because they're just more complicated pieces of equipment. So if you're trying to just start monitoring, I would recommend getting a carbon dioxide monitor. And they've been around for a long time. Um, I like the, there's like a Telair uh, device, T-E-L-A-I-R-E, I think. And um, I would say they're they're super cheap. They, we've had those for a long time if you wanted to start it there. Perfect, perfect. Um, Stacey also asked, how do you flush out the air in your home? Is there a way to do that without having to buy 
a system? Is there like something uh, a little bit more inexpensive that you could use to flush out the air? Yeah, so really to, to flush it out, you if you imagine like a balloon, you would want to empty the balloon entirely and then blow it up again and then do that a number of times. And so like if you think, think about like a hospital environment has like an air change per hour of like eight, I think it is. So that would mean you'd have to blow up the balloon and empty it eight times an hour. Uh, and so like, that's pretty high, a high frequency, if you think about the volume of a hospital. Um, but that's what people are recommending now in homes and in offices, just due to uh, goals of mitigating contagion. And so to do that in a home, it really has to do with um, the configuration of your home. So if you have operable windows, then you only can, you can, bring air from outside, but that would be assuming the, that the outside air is healthy. Um, and so typically if you only have side ventilation, so on one side, it's going to take a lot longer. Um, if you have cross ventilation, so, you know, windows that open on both sides, it's easier to kind of purge that air. It really does depend on the specific layout of your, of your home, but you're thinking of trying to just take all the air that's inside and purge it. So any way to induce cross ventilation is probably key. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I, this next question I think is for Lindsay. So um, when we think about the work that DLR group is doing, it seems at least in my understanding that this should be a standard that is applied across the entire industry. But the more that you talk about all of these different certifications and levels of, of assessing quality in, in buildings and in architecture, um, what are the cost comparisons and how broadly is this used across the industry? Because it almost feels like you're a very niche uh, uh, firm, whereas, you know, other uh, companies might be getting away with doing the bare minimum and putting a lot of people at risk. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of question. Sorry, that's that's, a, that, no that's been going on in my head for a while. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to break it down. So you're right. There is a bare minimum that we can do. It's called a code compliant building, um, and that code compliancy changes. Um, specifically in Florida, we have another round of code being adopted at the end of this year. So. It is taking um, improvements that are brought from other certifications or um, like Shona is a member of ASHRAE, but they're an entity that oversees mechanical uh, approach and design and limits. So the code is ever evolving and code changes through advocacy also. So there's um, members of the design community that do go and advocate for changes to make it more stringent. And then the demand, or so there's also um, pledges out there in which the building industry and has taken towards materials, towards um, the Architecture 2030 Challenge. So it's changing the market and the availability of the technology we need to deliver better buildings um, better or more quickly supply and demand. So I would say um, we used to track the difference of a lead building compared to any other building. And it's really, I would say you can achieve the goals that are desired um, for a lead building pretty within any budget. Wouldn't you agree, Shona? Where, where there's another rating system out there are, um, called the Living Building Challenge. And it is much more challenging and much more data driven. Um, and it's because some things aren't in the industry have not caught up to it, materials in particular. Um, and so that's one of those stretch goals we have for ourselves in the industry in which we are striving to get there. And even if we can't get there today, we're still specifying and trying to push the industry along. Um, but then LEED also has launched um, an approach towards a new standard of living. So making, trying to make the LEED rating system or other systems like that a, a basic standard, living standard. So there is discussions in the industry about 
um, rethinking our standard of care. So it is in process. Um, and I think we have manufacturers on board. We have a lot of folks on board to make this shift and this change in our industry. Um, I, don't, I would say we didn't 10 years ago, but now I think it's very holistically moving that way. And we're all learning every day. Um, but I definitely think technology and data and studies and research like what Shona has been doing has really been helping us work towards this evidence-based design, like having evidence and what materials we're selecting that Shona described. But I would say costs, um, you have to set forth the goals, understand the budget, and then align those two. And that's how you get there. I don't like to talk about premiums for your goals, I guess. So I don't have a lot well, of cost data. <laughs> I mean, I, like I said early on in this discussion, I don't know a lot about this topic, but from what I observe and what I see in my community, I'm seeing homes go up faster and faster than ever before where they're just kind of stitched together. And then when I see something devastating like the hurricane that hit you know, the, the panhandle, I'm seeing homes completely leveled in the matter of hours and a very select few homes and buildings that are actually resilient enough to withstand those types of impacts, right? And that leads me to question, what are the standards for that resiliency and what other conversations can we have even post this conversation? It sounds like a whole other hive where we talk about climate change resiliency, because if, they're, if, we're, if we're allowing developers to come in here in Florida, buy up land super cheap, build super cheap buildings that can't withstand the climate impacts that we're anticipating and setting the bar so low that we're allowing what chemicals and what materials we use in our buildings to impact our health and our cognitive functions something is really really wrong here oh. and yeah just like you said and this is something i try to say to our audience all the time that well, advocacy drives that change absolutely so um, the American Institute of Architects Florida um, conducts an advocacy day every year and we actually advocated for a number of issues this year and one of them, actually three of them were related to or were resiliency and sea level rise in coastal management or coastal construction standards. So um, it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, it's advocacy, not only to our legislator, but also to the building codes um, development board. Um, so there is actually a committee under that uh, AIA Florida board in which I actually am leading this year and next year is our resiliency committee. And we are working on a multi-pronged approach, um, not only for our members to bring uh, better choices, more resilient choices in materials and coastal construction to not only their commercial clients, but their residential clients become better advocates for coastal construction and perhaps get more involved in land development codes, revisions, zoning boards. Um, zoning boards have a profound impact on uh, making it like an, uh, an adjustment to the ordinances, especially on coastal. Uh, and then we're just looking to elevate building standards around um, coastal construction. Resiliency is not just related to climate change, but it's also related to human factors. And so we're trying to come up with all the different hazards in which we would have to adapt and mitigate and give those um, lessons to our members, AIA members, and then ultimately to the citizens and communities in which we serve. So advocacy is underway and um, that was really important for our board this year to make sure that we took a stand on sea level rise but not just sea level rise we've also studied the impacts of covid on a public health pandemic and how it's impacted all sorts of things related to the built environment and how would codes change related to um, things that we're witnessing with this current pandemic so no one thing about resiliency, and it goes back to Sarah's question, I, I looked up this, the PNC building in Pittsburgh, is around um, buildings that have passive strategies that may not work in the future. And so uh, if you think about Florida, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of hours in the year that it's comfortable outside, right, w without doing anything to the air. And so 
they're the they're the the hours that you can open your windows and so um some a lot of people keep talking about natural ventilation and that's what's happening in this pmc building they're doing a great job of actually pulling inspiration from middle eastern architecture and having passive strategies that ventilate the building um but there, there has to be comfortable air outside to bring in and so in places like florida that are going to get you know it's already very warm and it's going to get warmer um the hours in which you may be able to open your windows are less and so when we think about resiliency and think about um the amount of comfortable hours outside there there may need to be kind of a mixed mode scenario for for building operation where yes you can operate your build you can open your windows when a building has access to comfortable or healthy air outside but then you also need to plan for other scenarios about when you need to close your windows because there may be unhealthy air outside or maybe it's too hot or too cold and so that's where um sarah some of your um the buildings here that do do natural ventilation can only operate at times where you can open your windows just wanted to bring that back there to answer that question mm -hmm. Well, thank you ladies both so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to be our guest speakers tonight and sharing all of this really important information. Um, and, you know, I just thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so um, much for having us. If, yeah, thanks for having we us. have a number of topics related to healthier buildings. Um, yeah, I feel like we could, I just want to keep diving in because I feel like there's so much to uncover <laughs> here. Yeah, there's so much more to unpack that we could brainstorm into various other topics in which we could share with you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And, and the last point I want to drive home is that we as individuals drive that change through our demand, you know, and you can buy a cheap pair of shoes, flip flops and have it ruin your spine and keep buying those cheap pairs of shoes or we can actually start to invest in our spine and our health and buy a nice expensive pair of shoes that might have better soles and better structure and better foundation to support our bodies, right? Well, that's the same thing with our buildings. And so that's that's at least a, a metaphor that I was thinking the whole time of like, you know, I think these different certifications are, are important and uh, need to be talked about so that we actually demand better quality and better policy as well. So thank you ladies both so much. And um, in closing, next month, we are going to be talking about food. Everybody loves food month because everybody loves food. So we're going to talk about some delicious locally grown food and uh, inviting our guest, Jennifer Waxman Lloyd, who is uh, the executive director of The Village is Grown, talking about cultivating a vibrant community in the villages where she runs a 45 acre farm with greenhouses and helps with the distribution all across Central Florida of uh, really fresh and organic food and how that's even possible and how it's one of the largest uh, farms in the entire Southeast. So I'm super excited to talk to her about that. And we'll be inviting uh, Dr. Brooke Hansen to talk about climate and food justice. Uh, so stay tuned for that because there's a lot of overlap with uh, you know the social justice movements happening today with environmental justice movements and we want to be able to bridge those gaps and then talk about how in a COVID-19 world we can innovate our way out of it by creating sustainable food systems and future jobs for food entrepreneurs. So we will talk about that in the next month. Um, one of our quarterly events, Drink Beer, Talk Climate, we typically do this at a local brewery, but since we're not going to be able to do this in person, we highly encourage you to go and get a six pack of your local brewer of your choice. Um, my personal preference is Red Light, Red Light, or I like to get uh, some different bottled cocktails at Matador. Uh, go ahead and check out your local brewery and get ready for our Drink Beer, Talk Climate local food system edition on September 19th at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live. We have different people from different parts of the industry within the local food system here in Florida, people that are dealing with the local farmers markets, people that are doing distribution, uh, uh, indoor uh, 
controlled agriculture practices, traditional agriculture practices, and we even have uh, some policy and city planners that are going to be talking about what they're doing to change policy to help uh, incentivize local food movements here in Central Florida. So stay tuned for Food Month. Uh, our Ideas for Us St. Pete branch just had a really successful Ideas Hive on Monday, which will be coming soon to our YouTube, talking about how we want to end the shark trade in the U.S. Um, something really cool that we learned was that more people die uh, in an elevator every year than, than sharks. I might be quoting it wrong, but there, it's just absolutely ridiculous how much we over harvest uh, sharks in our oceans when they are not a threat. And for some reason, people think that it's okay because there, there's a really disgusting stigma against our beautiful shark friends in the ocean right now. And so we really wanna combat that. So we invited our friend Hunter Miller to talk from Oceana and the discussion was really engaging and we had so many people watching it. So stay tuned for that on our YouTube. And uh, something else exciting is that we have local elections coming up in August and we also have our elections coming up on November 3rd. Uh, one major uh, uh, amendment that I'd like to talk about is the amendment to save Split Oak Forest. This is a forest that is a hub of habitats and ecological systems uh, endemic to Florida. Many species, 700 species of animals and plants that are not found in, in any other place in the US or in the world. And these animals are about to be completely pushed to the side for a toll road to nowhere if we let developers in the Central Florida Expressway plow their way through this beautiful forest. And so it is on us to vote against it uh, by voting yes on Amendment 2. And if you're interested in learning more about what type of ecological systems will be destroyed, check out our YouTube. We interviewed Valerie Anderson, who is the head of the Friends of Split Oak, who's been advocating for this natural conservation area for years. And um, we also did a Spanish interpretation of the interview so that you can, you know, uh, share it with any Spanish speaking friends that might be um, able to learn more and hopefully vote to protect this forest as well. And of course, if you're interested in volunteering, please uh, go ahead and email us at savesplitoak at gmail.com or just right that you want to hang out with us in the chat. I'm leading some of those things in my free time. So I'm definitely interested in mobilizing more volunteers to be able to save this forest. And uh, we're going to be doing another uh, town hall to talk even deeper about this toll road to nowhere and why developers are using Split Oak, which is one of the most protected, legally protected uh, forest in our entire state, and yet they are systematically uh, disassembling our policy to get into this forest, which will then set a precedent for all the other protected areas. Uh, if they can split Split Oak, they're going to be able to easily turnkey their way into developing other natural areas that have lesser protections across the state. So this is extraordinarily important. This is not just about split oak. This is about saving all of our areas that have species that are already dwindling in numbers. And if we don't protect them with our vote on November 3rd or volunteer our time to, to wave signs and knock on doors, then this beautiful area is going to be cut in half. Animals are going to die and never be seen again by our children or our children's children and future protected areas are gonna be at risk as well. So it's on us, ladies and gentlemen. Um, to talk about our last little bits of programs coming up, we have our fleet farming program, which is still thriving. And what we've been able to do in order to still give free education events for those of you who are gardening at home. So many of you are experimenting outside gardening at home, which I love. Uh, we do remote garden education opportunities, one-on-ones that you can schedule today. 
We do ask for a donation, but it's not mandatory. Honestly, I love talking about gardening in my sleep. So, you know, go ahead and sign up. We want to be your garden guidance counselor and help you feel confident in having a relationship with nature through growing food in your own backyard. And uh, I'll tell you that ever since we started doing these remote garden education opportunities, we had so many people that the first thing they say, I swear, is that they don't have a green thumb. I don't know what that means because no one is born knowing how to cultivate food, but I will say that that inspired our team during our working at home hours to start creating more resources on our website for those of us in Central Florida who might be having really bad pest issues or might not know how to amend their soil. So I've been meeting with soil experts and creating YouTube videos and more pages on our website to easily communicate different types of soil different types of organic pest management opportunities that you can incorporate in your practices. And hopefully if you check out our YouTube, you'll be able to watch these different videos and educate yourself because I know when you try to Google your way through gardening, it can be a lot of information and you can get really overwhelmed. So check out our YouTube for those of you that live in Central Florida and our website for more resources. And last but not least, our uh, Edible Landscapes Department is back in action. So if you're interested in having us come out for a fee for service to build a garden for you, even though we're trying to give you free resources to build it on your own, but if you really need support and you don't wanna to go to Home Depot and buy a bunch of stuff and then not know what to do, or you want a little bit more help, um, you can go ahead and check out our website and book a consultation at fleetfarming.org slash edible landscapes. So thank you all so much. Please take care and be safe and healthy. And if you have any questions, or if you want to get involved or sign up on our website for a job or an internship, please check out ideasforus.org and send some love to our guest speakers. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time tonight. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy your evening. <laughs>